today with us, we have a special guest. Professor Michael Dunford is an emeritus professor, School of Global Studies, University of Sussex, and managing editor of Area Development and Policy. His interests are in world development and multiple geographical scales from the local to the international level. He has been visiting professor at universities in various cities across Europe and at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He is a prolific author of academic papers and books as well, far too numerous to mention. Uh, welcome back to the Bridge Podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's a very great pleasure to come and speak to you again. You know, we met in Laza. Mm -hmm. uh, we were on our way to an expo. Could you tell us your thoughts on your experience of going and visiting Shizan? Okay. I mean, I just went once and I stayed for five days. Um, I mean, but as, as we left the aeroplane, actually, as we flew in, <clears throat> I mean, the first thing that was striking was just how stunning the natural environment is. Mm. And then, you know, when you, when you walk, you look up and you see the sky, and the sky seems closer than it has ever mm. seemed anywhere else in, in my life. Um, I came there because of a, it was a culture and tourism expo, and apart from the meetings, uh, we visited quite a lot of places. Um, and, you know, some of the things struck me very strongly. I mean, first of all was to see the Tibetans very actively practicing their religion. So I went to Jokang, but also went to other temples. So that, that was the first thing. And then the second thing was um, I went to the uh, Surf Museum. And, I mean, to go to that museum is really an extraordinary experience because you see the reality, you know, of the theocracy that ruled in Cezanne, you know, until liberation. I think anybody who goes to uh, Lhasa, you know, should visit that museum, you know, in order to understand what Tibet was before uh, 1958, 1959. Um, we also visited, we visited these schools that were teaching Tanka art, several of them. So, you know, again, this is um, the reproduction of traditional Tibetan religious culture, and went to um, libraries that were concerned with the preservation of ancient Tibetan manuscripts. Mm. So that was, that was something that was very striking, you know, was the very active reproduction, preservation of Tibetan culture. But then, you know, in economic development terms, you know, the progress is really very, very striking indeed. And I think that was the other thing that, that, that struck us, you know, in, in that particular short visit. But it's a beautiful place, and I would love to go again. <laughs> you know, I didn't get a chance to go to the Surf Museum. Now I feel like next time I go back, I want to see that as well. But I do remember the sky, and I made the same comment to one of my, uh, someone traveling with me, that the sky seemed almost like an LED screen, because it was so mm. luminescent blue. But yeah, yeah, they were. I also went to Jokong Temple, and uh, they were practicing, you know. So that was important to me, to see that for myself. I think a lot of people who were wondering about that should go for themselves to see it firsthand so that they can have a better understanding. And t uh, you wrote a paper a full decade ago with Thomas Bonshaw entitled Chinese Regional Development mm -hmm. and Policy in Regions Magazine, wherein you argue, quote, China's regional disparities are a consequence of geographical factors of the gap between rural and urban areas and of China's choice of development strategy. The Qinghai Tibet Plateau, standing at 4,000 to 5,000 meters above sea level, and much of the second tier of mountains plateau and basins lying between 1 and 2,000 meters are considerably relatively unsuitable for development. And you thereafter researched China's poverty alleviation program, which successfully ended absolute poverty in 2020, as defined by the World Bank. Uh, what techniques did you observe that helped China alleviate poverty at such difficult geographic in such difficult geographical regions? Okay, um, I mean, I, I went to Wushu huh? in Qinghai. Um, I went very shortly after the earthquake in 2010. So the the reason for going was uh, to pay some attention to reconstruction after a disastrous earthquake. So um, at that point in time, you know, it's an area which is, is essentially centered on animal husbandry and agriculture, but also uh, Tibetan 
medicine because there are very valuable, valuable plants, food processing, and so on. And in relation to that, um, when you go to that area, you, you see that they encounter enormous challenges, you know, especially in terms of desertification. But the main concern at that point in time was basically about uh, re-establishing people's, li uh, people, people's living conditions. Mm -hmm. So in other words, getting people into housing, dealing with issues to do with water supply, electricity supply, and so on. Um, I mean, in, in that, it was very striking, you know, because, you know, this was only a short time after the earthquake. Progress was actually very, very rapid indeed in terms of re reconstructing housing and getting people rehoused. We, we visited several sort of reconstruction sites. One was a very, very large one, you know, a large settlement on the edge of a, of a county town, you know, actually adjacent to the, to the secondary school. But then we also went to one which was a longer term rural redevelopment project where people had been basically relocated from a remote location. They'd been provided with new houses, um, they had uh, solar energy mm -hmm. provided, and the, there was uh, road access, you know, to nearby settlements. So, but that was sort of in terms of thinking about the longer term reestablishment of, of livelihood, you know, through things like, you know, uh, the development of agricultural processing, you know, the, uh, basically developing agro-tourism, developing handicrafts and these sorts of things. But the, the, these issues were more concerned with livelihoods which lay further down the road. But, I mean, afterwards we didn't go back again, so it's difficult really for me to say much very sensible about what actually happened, you know, in terms of uh, the restoration of livelihoods in that particular part of Qinghai. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you contributed uh, to a book uh, this year entitled Exploring the Social Model. In the chapter Poverty Alleviation in China, uh, you wrote the new, or you and your, maybe your partner uh, wrote, the new China saw life expectancy increase from 35 in 1949 to 57 in 1957 and 68 in 1981. Many have argued, including me online, uh, that China raised 700 million people out of poverty mm. since 1990. Uh, can you tell us maybe why that argument isn't a correct assessment of how development proceeded in China? Okay. Um, can I say first of all, um, you know, people use, you said 700, uh, 700 million, some people say 800 million, some people say 1980, you just said 1990. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that it is absolutely vital that there is some clarity about precisely what one is talking about. Um, the most common account I've heard is that 800 million maybe since 1980. Now, you know, in, in, in 1980 there were one, uh, one billion people in China. So 800 million is 8 out of 10 Chinese people. It's the entire rural population because over 80% were rural were lifted out of poverty. Now, if you, if you look at China at that time, you can say that, yes, China was a poor country. But when you say China was a poor country, you're comparing China with other countries such as the United States. So China was a long way, right, a long, long way behind the more advanced countries in the world. And in that sense, you can say all Chinese people, virtually all Chinese people were poor. And you can say today, China is an upper middle income country. Um, income per head, average income per head is at PPS, um, about one third of that of the United States. So in a sense, you know, China is still relatively poor. Right, so that's the first thing. But the second thing I wanted to say is this, it's that there's another view of poverty, definition of poverty. And this definition of poverty is commonly used in relation to, develop, to developing countries. It's a definition of poverty which identifies something called absolute poverty, which is concerned with whether people are actually able to survive or not. You know, so do they have sufficient food? Do they have sufficient clothing? Do they have shelter? Are they able to keep themselves warm? So this is another way of looking at poverty. Are there people who are below the income that is required for survival and when they speak about these things they speak about income and I shall I shall say in a minute why it's important to not forget that it's about income you could say should one not pay attention to the quality of goods and not just income I'll just leave that on one side in um, in 1967 Fuchs 
said the following. He said, today's comfort or convenience is yesterday's luxury and tomorrow's necessity. So our sense of what we need changes over the course of time. So should you use a 2011 poverty line in order to judge how many people in China were under that, uh, were in extreme poverty 30 years ago? I'll just leave that as a question. Um, the World Bank you know, measures poverty in this way. It, it developed this famous dollar a day. You need a dollar a day. And uh, in 2011, the limit was $1.93 per day. And this was set as an absolute poverty line, which could be applied globally. Now, to apply it globally, they have to use purchasing power parities in order to work out how much, say, um, 100 renminbi will purchase. Now, there's a problem with the purchasing power standard indicator because the prices they measure include luxury cars, staying in five-star hotels, international air travel. In other words, it's not an indicator of the prices of the essential goods that are required, you know, by people whose living standards are relatively low. Um, there, is a, there is another approach. This approach is associated with a British economic historian called R.C. Allen. And what, what he did was he said, what is the minimum basket of goods someone needs to survive? And he looked at the requirement for heating. Now, the requirement for heating depends where you live. It's quite different if you live in Siberia from what you need if you, if you live in Thailand. He then said, you need a certain number of calories. How much does it cost? to consume in one year the minimum number of calories using locally available foods at locally available prices. What is the rent of housing? What is the cost of the minimum amount of heating that you need for cooking? And from this, they basically worked out how much income people need. And then they, they looked at, at how many, they looked at information about income of households, and then they worked out how many households were beneath that line. Now, Moatsos applied that method to China. And I'll tell you what he came up with. He said, in, we'll take, I'll take 1981. In 1981, 129 million people were beneath that line. Wow. 100, it's, it's a high number. 129 million, okay? Um, in that year, well, in, 2000, in, in, in that year also, using China's own poverty line, 1978 poverty line, uh, that line identified 152 million people, but just rural people. 152 million rural people were beneath the poverty line. Okay? Now, those two figures are relatively close. All right? I'll comment on them in a minute. If you use China's 2010 poverty line, or if you use the, which is almost the same as the World Bank's 2011 poverty line, if you apply it in 1980, you get, in rural areas, 745 million, and Moatsos, in the whole of China, 880 million. Mm. So you can see where the eight, that, that may be where the 800 million comes from. By May, using maybe. figures from 2011. Using the 2010 poverty line and applying it in 1980s, 1980 China. Now, Moatsos did something quite interesting then because he then looked at what happened from 1980. And he found that in the, from 1990 to 1995, poverty in China increased very strongly indeed. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, I w I'm not going to talk about why that m may well have happened. But it was a period of rapid inflation, mm. and there were many other changes in China in that era in the direction of liberalization. At the beginning of reform and opening up. In the 1980s, the, the situation got better. Mm. But in the, in the 1990s, the early 1990s, to the middle, middle, middle of the 1990s, in that period. And then from then, it went down. Mm. Now, I want to go back. If you say 800 million people were living in extreme poverty, you know, in um, 1980, mm -hmm. of one million, one, you know, one billion people. What does that say about what China achieved in the first 30 years? 
Mm. I mean, in a sense, you are denigrating, in my view, you are denigrating the achievements of the first 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, using income in that period is deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, Amartya Sen is a, he's now passed, but a specialist. He pointed out that in China at that time there was a network of health services involving cooperative medical systems, commune clinics, barefoot doctors, widespread public health measures. Food was distributed through public channels and it was rationed. Rural people by 1981 under the household uh, responsibility system had their own contracted land. They had a Jai GD on which they built their own house, so they didn't have to pay rent. Mm. They had a plot on which they produced much of their own food. Now, that means that people's survival did not, in many respects, depend on a cash income. So why assume that you had to have cash when at that point in time you did not need cash mm -hmm. income? Mm -hmm. So for that reason, you know, that methodology is deeply problematic in mm -hmm. relation to China at that time. And it's also, you know, it's inconsistent with what the World Bank found when it came in the early 1980s. Because in 1983, you know, the World Bank declared that China's most remarkable achievement during the past three decades was to have made low-income groups far better off in terms of basic needs than their counterparts in most other poor countries. And, I mean, if you look at... Um, the numbers that Moatz has produced, you know, it's very, very striking. I mean, in 1980, he thought that Chinese extreme poverty was about uh, 5%. But in India, it was 50%. In Indonesia, it was 45%. So what, what I'm saying is, you know, we have to be very, very careful about specifically what we're talking about. Now, when the last poverty campaign started, you know, 2013, 2014, there were, under China's then, you know, 2010 poverty line, there were basically 90 million people. That's a large number of people. And in seven years, every single one of those households was lifted above that poverty line. Mm -hmm. And many of them were lifted far above it. And, I mean, that was an absolutely incredible achievement. You know, you, you can never minimize that extraordinary achievement. But I think you must be careful about what you're talking about because you should never underplay what China achieved in the first 30 years in a very difficult international context, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, because of the relationships with the United States, because it was embargoed, you know, because of then the difficulty in the relationships with the Soviet Union and so on. So that's what I'm saying. So, mm -hmm. I mean, China has lived, you know, all of its people, their living standards have increased dramatically, you know. Mm -hmm dramatically. I mean, from, from 1949 and then also, you know, from 1978-9. That's an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement. Chinese people, you know, now have a much higher standard of living, mm -hmm. you know, than their counterparts many years ago, and their position in relation to the rest of the world is much, much stronger. But there's further to go, you know, and, which is interesting, you know, because when Xi Jinping talked about, you know, the outcome of the recent plenary, you know, his first comment, you know, the first comment he made was that the rural-urban gap is still too large, and that mm. there are many, you know, there are, there are many people whose livelihoods have not been improved sufficiently. And, and he said, you know, the primary contradiction is the gap between, you know, and imbalances, he said, you know, in terms of the extent to which people's needs are satisfied. So there's still a long way to go. But, you know, over these, you know, 70 odd years, you know, of the new China, I think what has been achieved is astonishing, both, you know, in the first era and then in the era of reform. And, and then even particularly, I think, in the new era, you know, which started in 2012, 2013. So early on, you know, this, this, this health provision, public health measures, played an enormous role, basically in increasing, increasing life expectancy. Um, you know, then secondly, you know, I spoke about the food distribution. You know, the systems of food distribution was designed to ensure that everybody had enough food to eat. In that era, you know, I've said all the way through, you know, people had the rural people had their plots on which they could grow food that they needed. So again, you know, to a significant extent, they met their own food needs. Mm. Clothing. People made their own clothing, mm. you know, so you could get, uh, buy cheap fabric and then make your own clothing. So, you know, the, the, the cooking fuel, you know, so they used timber or coal depending on where you were. So, you know, they found fuel. But, I mean, more recently, of course, 
because of the loss of forest cover and so on, we know cutting timber has been restricted. So, you know, things evolve over the course of time. So, you know, in China, there, there was basically, you know, collective property, collective property rights. And these property rights basically enabled people, you know, to meet many of their own needs, either within in rural areas in the commune system when it existed, subsequently under the household rep uh, responsibility system. So I think that was, that was very important. Mm. Um, uh, My, I have a follow-up question, because you specifically point out the period from 2013 to 2020. Um, you've lived here, and I know that you get to travel a lot in China. Could you tell me some of the tactics that China used during that period that enabled China to raise people out of poverty? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, let, me start, let me start earlier, okay? Sure. Um, you know, in, uh, actually, in the new China, you know, this is in the 1950s, there's an area called the Three West, Sigai Hai, which is in, in Ningxia. That was identified as um, a, a, an area that was subject to very serious poverty. And actually, there were programs at that time to address these problems of food, clothing, shelter, and so on. But then, in the early 1980s, in 1982, there was a special program for agricultural development in that area because that area, in that area, 74% of people were under China's poverty line. It's a very, very large share. Um, so at that time, that area was a pro an area that posed challenges, ser serious, serious challenges. And then um, in this new poverty alleviation program, mm -hmm. that area was also an object of activity because 40,000 people from that area were relocated on the edge of the Gobi Desert. And there was a scheme under which initially they moved to new houses, you know, uh, but they kept their old homes mm -hmm. you know, if, in case they needed to go back. And uh, actually there's a, a, a television serial, all right? It's called uh, uh, Shanghai Qing, you know, which actually depicts the transfer, you know, the difficulties, you know, of managing this transformation. It looks at the way in which these people were relocated and then how new livelihoods were built, you know, and then, mm. oh, you know, producing mushrooms and then the complications in finding markets for mushrooms and finding, you know, other people doing the same thing, you know, so they were trying to develop ways of developing, you know, commercial livelihoods and then putting in, you know, public, public infrastructure and public services and so on. So it's, it's very, you know, this, this is very striking, you know, so it's very interesting that uh, this area, you know, in, 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 the in the 1980s, the Food and Agricultural Organization said that area is unfit for human habitation, yet people live there. So, th so I, I mean, that, that in a sense emphasizes what you said at near the beginning when you were talking about, say, the Tibetan Plateau. I mm. mean, the, the challenges are amazing. And so, I mean, to have achieved what China has achieved is, is in some sense, is even more remarkable because you're dealing with such difficult conditions in which uh, one is seeking to establish, you know, viable human, human livelihoods. Now, you know, from 1986, there were a succession of poverty alleviation programs. There was one from uh, 1986 to 93, 1994 to 2001, 2001 to 2010, 2011 to 2020, but that one was then di disrupted because mm. they adopted the one that started in 2013 to 2020. And Basically, in these programs, the emphasis was always on what they call development-oriented poverty alleviation. In other words, you know, economic development will provide people with opportunities to earn incomes, and then through earning incomes, they will be able to meet their own livelihood needs. So that, that was the center, you know, all the way through that period. Um, in, the, in the new millennium, more attention started to be paid to the fact that quite a lot of households, you know, impoverished households, are poor because they're not able to work because of illness, disability, and so on. Now, I mean, China's had, you know, since what, the 1950s, it's had a, a scheme which basically of, uh, guarantees people, you know, certain minimum things in terms of food, shelter, clothing, um, food, shelter, clothing, um, burial expenses, and health. But then, uh, in the new millennium, in 2000, they, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, and a whole series of new measures were adopted, in pr including providing people with minimum life guarantees in situations where they weren't able to meet, meet their own needs. Now, 
in that period, you know, the policies evolved. You know, I mean, a lot of emphasis was on agricultural modernization and trying to develop characteristic industries and working in conjunction with, you know, so-called dragon head enterprises that would help in terms of technology, in terms of marketing local produce, you know, in order to generate increased incomes from processing, you know, lo local, local products and marketing them. So you saw developments in agriculture, aquaculture, livestock raising and so on. Um, a lot of investment occurred in things like village roads, mm -hmm. you know, trying to improve village infrastructure and later on, you know, providing access to internet services, which of course became extremely important, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the last 10 or 15 years, you know, enabling, enabling people basically sell, you know, what, local products on, on, the, on, the, on the internet to much, much wider markets. Um, primary and secondary education, emphasis upon voc voc vocational training. Um, there were schemes of preferential credit. There was uh, microcredit provided. Dilapidated buildings were rehabilitated, but there were also schemes of relocation and resettlement. So moving people from extremely remote and inhospitable places to new locations mm -hmm. where they were provided with new houses, mm -hmm. okay, and where schools and public infrastructure was provided. Then there were ecological protection, you know, so I talked mm. about, you know, the cutting mm. the timber, you know, I mean, after a while, you know, you had uh, these programs which were basically designed in order to protect the ecology, and what happened there was that if farmers took their land out of cultivation, planted trees, for example, then they would receive, you know, annual payments in terms of com compensation. Mm. There were labor transfer schemes, you know, for people to move to other places to work. So, I mean, in the case of Sigahai and, you know, the Gobi Desert, you know, that was a cooperation program, you know, mm. between Fujian and, uh, and Ningxia. So, you know, people would go to Fujian, you know, to, to work for a while. Um, so they also, you know, they, it was also interesting because over time they developed this kind of participatory village planning, you know, where there was consultation with people in mm -hmm. villages about what sort of choices they should make in terms of their local development. So that, that was basically how it progressed until, you know, 2013, 14. And then, then they started this, um, they called it uh, Jingjun Fu Pin, right? Targeted or precise mm -hmm. poverty mm -hmm. alleviation. And, you know, what, what they did is amazing. You know, they identified individual poverty households. Now basically people could apply and then in some cases there was a kind of democratic appraisal of these households by local people and then local government would then investigate and initially they identified 89 million, you know I said 90 million approximately, 89 million households were identified. Then after they investigated about 8 million were removed because they found that they had assets of which uh, they were not originally aware. Mm. But then they added another 9 million. So you're back to, to 90 million. Now, of these, you know, 42%, you know, were poor because of illness and disability. 20% mm. were due to disasters. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're uh, you know, on a high plateau, you know, and you've, you're involved in livestock raising, and if there's a extremely heavy snow, you can lose your livestock. Mm. You lose your, li lose your livestock, you lose, you know, part of your livelihood. So... Um, obviously, you know, the uh, minimum income guarantees played an important role, but in relation to other people, they, they basically sent, you know, the cadres down into the villages. You know, so at the peak, you know, nine, uh, it was, uh, how many was it at the peak? It was about uh, 900,000, I think, cadres were in 2017 were in the villages. And they, they worked with these households to develop business plans. Mm. And these business plans were designed to see ways in which that individual household could lift itself out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the things that happened, you know, are very, very diverse because they obviously mm. depend upon lo local conditions. But um, basically, you know, uh, in that era also, you know, the government committed to 295 billion RMB just in 2017. So that also, you know, was extremely important. Mm -hmm. So you've got this commitment, you know, of, of human resources, you know, you've got this commitment of financial resources. But then, you know, it also happened, you know, because of general infrastructure investment. I mean, you know, the, the, all the, the construction of high-speed rail, of railways, you know, the development mm -hmm. of logistics systems, these places, if you like, connected these places with the rest of China. So they, they also, you know, this is general infrastructure provision. This, 
created, you know, circumstances in which these places were more closely integrated with the rest of China and therefore, mm. you know, enhanced their, de their development prospects. And then you had general policy measures, you know, because, I mean, in the, er in the early part of the new millennium, you know, for example, they scrapped agricultural taxes, all right? And there were a whole series of other measures. You had the, the introduction of a new medical insurance system mm. for rural people. So, you know, these measures, you know, were also extremely important, you know, in sort of contributing, you know. So what's very interesting, you know, is that they're acting on multiple fronts, you know, mm. integrating a large number of different strategies. factors yeah. and strategies, you know, which are, you know, articulated, which are, you know, combined with the specificities of particular localities in mm. order to generate strategies that are effective. And, I, I, you know, in terms of its results, it's, it is extraordinary, you know. Mm. But I think, I think it's something, you know, I mean, mistakes are made, but it's something that I find, you know, having been in China for a while, it's something that characterizes China, you know, mm -hmm. and it's this kind of commitment also of the CPC, mm -hmm. this commitment of the CPC and Chinese government, you know, that's very, very important, you know, because without that, many of these things would never have happened. <clears throat> well, I mean, I have, I, I've been looking at the statistics globally for poverty re reduction, and it looks like more than half of all Poverty reduction has happened in China in the world in the last 20 or 30 years. So my question is, in other parts of the world that are still developing and they still have people living under the absolute poverty line, what kind of what so, are some of the strategies you would like to see replicated elsewhere? Or is it everything? Well, I think that's a very difficult question. I mean, this, this, this number comes from the World Bank methodology, all right? Yeah. And I've already said a few words about yeah, the World Bank sure. methodology. <clears throat> Um, no, I think, I think, I mean, what China did in many senses is very, very practical things, mm. <clears throat> you know, centered around improving economic livelihoods. So, I, you know, I think many, many, uh, you know, many, many, many of these measures, you know, can be uh, examined and adopted, you know, in, in other parts of the world to address, address poverty issues. You know. um, I mean, in the past, you know, right the way through, you know, the 1980s and 1990s, you know, China worked, you know, with people from the World Bank, you know, people from uh, international organizations concerned with poverty alleviation. So China was seeking to learn from the experience mm -hmm. of others, you mm -hmm. know, and in the same way, you know, I think other places, you know, have a very, very great deal that they can learn from, from China's experience mm -hmm. in this respect, you know, especially in, you know, um, parts of the, glo the global south. And I think I mean, well, well, maybe we'll come on to it, but, you know, parts of China's own international action, you know, push in, push mm -hmm. in this direction. So I think, you know, look, look at what they did, you know, in particular places, you know. I mean, there was a really interesting scheme, you know, run by people from China Agricultural University in, in, uh, um, on the border with Laos, mm. right, in Yunnan, you know. And that, and that was an interesting scheme because, you know, they, people's houses were rebuilt, but they built guest rooms. And then these guest rooms, then they, they established a cooperative, you know, in order to internalize the revenues that were generated mm. from the visitors who were coming to take part in seminars and all sorts of other events. And while they were there, staying in these people's homes. I mean, that led to a very significant increase in household income, you mm. know, until the pandemic. Mm. And then, of course, that suddenly, that raised a question, you know, I mean, it's good, you know, to raise people's income, but at the same time, you've got to think about, well, how do you ensure that you don't create risks mm -hmm. as well? Now, I mean, you know, oh, on the other side of the pandemic, you know, the situation is better again. But I mean, these, these are, this is another important consideration. I didn't really say very much about it, but how can you develop strategies, you know, that improve people's livelihoods, but don't generate risks, mm -hmm. you know, that they might confront? Well, right now, we are in the midst of something called the Common Prosperity Campaign. Oh. And the third plenary session just happened. You uh, have written on the topic, and you sent me some of your papers, on quality new productive forces, which is a huge part of how China is moving forward in its development. How do you see this supporting China's overall goals, and how is it related to economic prosperity? Okay, well, actually, you're talk there are two questions there. You know, yeah, you talked about common <laughs> prosperity, and you talked about... Sure, sure. Okay, let's, let's just tackle one at a time, then. Okay, well, oh, I deal with common prosperity first, okay? Um, <clears throat> I go back to Deng Xiaoping. Huh? Mm -hmm. Deng, Xi Deng Xiaoping said uh, socialism has two characteristics. He said the first is common prosperity. The second is public ownership. Mm -hmm. He said these are the two distinguishing characteristics of 
socialism. Um, he defined common prosperity as the avoidance of social polarization. And then he said, public property could prevent it. No, we know that in capitalist countries, it doesn't prevent it. You know, um, we know that it generates very strong polarization. Um, you know, Mao Zedong, you know, actually in 1975, Mao said, uh, when speaking about the development of a commodity economy, he said, such things can only be restricted under the dictatorship of the proletariat. You know, then in 1982, China drew up a new constitution which embodied the four cardinal principles. So, so this is absolutely critical. You know, th it means that in a sense, a government, you know, representing the interests and concerns of all the Chinese people is in a sense in command. Now, in um, China, the idea of common prosperity, you know, was first mentioned in 1953 in connection with agricultural collectivization, agricultural mm -hmm. cooperatives, mm -hmm. agricultural collectivization, which was pushed through, you know, on the one hand, because um, <clears throat> It meant that um, collectives, you know, would become a market for agricultural equipment, so you create a market for agricultural equipment, but also it's a mechanism for generating income, because China had to generate capital largely, not entirely, but largely internally to industrialize in that era. Mm -hmm. So it was introduced at that time, but then in 1978, People's Daily published um, an article in which they said... Uh, let some people get rich first. Let some places get rich first. And then afterwards, it is their responsibility to help everybody else get rich. I mean, Deng Xiaoping repeatedly said that. You know, allow some people to get rich first and then require them, which means places, people, to help everybody else become rich. Mm. <clears throat> So, you know, that was the start, of, uh, the start of reform and opening up. And I mean, you know, in that period, you know, as I suggested a while ago, you know, inequalities, well, in the first period, you know, the 1980s, rural urban inequalities diminished. But from then, they increased very, very sharply. Regional inequalities increased very sharply. The Gini coefficient increased very sharply. Then, at the end, towards the end of 19, 1990s, you know, I mean, China was looking at the sort of repercussions of the Asian financial crisis. You started to hear more about common prosperity, and after that, you you you, you saw significant rural reform. All right, you, you, this type, you know, new socialist countryside projects. You know, I mean, the measures to remove agricultural uh, taxes and so on. A whole series of measures. The, the rural health insurance schemes whole series of schemes, you know, to address the development of the countryside. And also at that time, you know, uh, decisions were made about Western development. So a large volume of resources were pr used to drive Western development, you know, government resources. And a lot of investment in infrastructure, you know, which means, you know, road, you know, rail, but also telecommunications infrastructure into the remoter parts of China, but also into, into villages, you know, laying the foundations, you know, f for what, what came later. And then, you know, when C, with, with in the new era, I mean, C puts very, very strong emphasis upon it. And, and basically, you know, it means lifting everybody together. It means that everybody gets rich together, reducing gaps in development. And I come back to what he said, you know, uh, about the objectives of the plenary, you know, addressing this primary contradiction, you know, which is the imbalanced extent to which human needs have been satisfied. <clears throat> Now, you said, I mean, do you want me to talk about it qualitatively? Now? I do, absolutely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, basically, I mean, just to finish on that, what's interesting about that plenary, I've not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to look much more closely, you know, at the... At the um, well, before actually, before you go back to quali it's qualitative new productive forces, can we talk about common prosperity one more time? Sure. Because you're talking about the Gini uh, Indus, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Do you see that improving over the next 10 to 15 years, or is it going to be everyone rising up, including wealthy people? Do you see that it's going to, there's going to be less 
uh, wealth disparity between rural and urban areas? Do you see less wealth disparity between wealthy citizens in cities and uh, s people living maybe on the periphery of cities? Well, China, I mean, China, China says it wants to increase the size of the middle income group. I mean, it, on the genie, you know, it peaked at about 2008 and then it's flattened <clears throat> and it's diminished a little. I mean, again, you know, I mean, you have to pay attention to rights which do not require income in terms of access to public services, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the rural property rights. Mm. They're very, very, they're very, they're still very, very important. They're very you know? robust too, yeah. Yeah, very important. And, and this is something that <coughs> sharply differentiates China from many other, you know, developing countries. I mean, <coughs> People have said, you know, you know, you compared China with South Africa. You know, well, basically, in South Africa, you know, the rural population was dispossessed. You mm. know, in China, it was not. You know, it retained very, very significant property rights, and those, you know, so so you need to take them into account when you say, you know, how large is the genie? But China says it wants to increase the size of middle income groups. But I mean, I think you know they've also talked about you know altering, the, making the distribution of income more even. And in fact, you know, if, if there are problems to do with aggregate demand, you know, I don't think that's the fundamental, I mean, it's an important issue, but if there are issues to do with aggregate demand, then you know that increases in the income of low-income people lead to greater consumption expenditure than do increases in the income of high-income people. So, um, <clears throat> so I think that's, that's something important that should be borne in mind. Um, I, you know, I think, there, I think there's some, you know, you've seen action against some ways in which very, very high incomes were mm -hmm, used, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, which were very important, especially in, in, in 20, 2020, you know, but I mean, a lot of, a lot of actions on a whole series, series of fronts mm -hmm. that are very important. Okay, so in the third plenary session, qualitative new productive forces yeah. came up. How is this going to contribute to China's economy moving forward? Well, look, you know, the, you know the, the, the most important driver of income is basically productivity, labor productivity. So what you have to do is increase labor productivity. That's the, that's the top priority. And the way you do that is essentially through investment. Okay? Essentially through investment. Now, at this point in time, I mean, in the past, China has engaged in what one might call catch-up industrialization. You know, it's been a kind of follower. You know, it's, import, it's a, acquired technologies and know-how that had already been developed elsewhere. But at this point in time, you know, at this point in time, we, we are on the verge of, of you know, the, a fourth industrial revolution. Okay, so we have new energy, quantum computing, electric vehicles, artificial intelligence, robotics, aerospace, drone technologies, life sciences, you know, we, we're, on, we're on the verge of, of the development of new technologies and the application of new technologies in ways that can radically increase productivity. And I think, you know, this idea of qualitatively new productive forces is about mobilizing these new productive forces in order to increase productivity, but also, you know, to address other challenges, you know, the, ch the climate challenge, you know, the challenge of establishing an ecological civilization. But I mean, also you can think about spiritual civilization and the ways in which, you know, the internet and these new technologies, sorry, can contribute, you know, to, you know, uh, in increase, increasing the meaningfulness and, you know, improving education, improving the dissemination of information, improving information about the dissemination of culture, and improving the quality of people's cultural, cultural lives. So they represent an extraordinary opportunity uh, you know, basically, this, this idea, this I the idea, the concept comes from Marx. You know, basically, Marx said that the forces of production are the, the material, technological, and intellectual capabilities involved in meeting human needs. So this is about mobilizing new technologies that can play a very, very important role in, in, in meeting human needs and improving the quality of human life and enabling China you know, to achieve its, what are now, what is 20, 20, uh, 2029, 2035, you know, 2049 objectives. Um, so, this is uh, new methods of production, new ways of doing things, new products, uh, 
new types of old products, and so on. So, but to do this, you have to mobilize investment. So investment is the critical driver, you know, because it drives you know, innovation, the application of innovation, the creation of, uh, of uh, new infrastructure, and so on. So it is the fundamental driver, and I think it's why China puts so much emphasis upon in, on investment and also upon the mobilization of financial resources to support innovation and, and investment. Now, beyond that, um, I would say that um, you know China's old growth model has, in a sense, lost momentum. You know, you say, what was it? Well. China was involved in low-wage export processing industries. You know, when I, f I first came to China just for a meeting in 2006, and I met someone from the NDRC, you know, the Macroeconomic Research Unit, and the first thing he said to us was, uh, actually, you know, China's uh, economic development is really centered around unskilled, low-technology industries, and it has to change. Okay? Now, that's, that's true. So these industries, these export industries are extremely important, but they need to be upgraded, made digital, green. You, know, you don't abandon them. You don't do what the European countries and North America did. You don't abandon them, you know, but you upgrade them. The second, you know, was basically real estate. And the real estate market generated extraordinary financial risks financial problems, you know, which are brought under control with these three red lines. But obviously that has a negative impact on the short term on economic development, but it was something that absolutely had to be done. And obviously in this uh, plenum, you know, one of the things they were discussing is the way of establishing a more, you know, viable, you know, real estate sector in the longer term. And then the third was the, these digital platforms. Now, I mean, these digital platforms play an important role, but they were basically monopolies. And they, they were engaging in things that really they shouldn't have been engaged in, you know, lending credit, you know, or wanting to lend credit to vulnerable young people at very high <laughs> rates of interest. You know, you can't allow that. Mm. And then also, you know, if people use these platforms, they take a very large share. You know, if someone sells something on these platforms, they take a very large share of the income. Mm -hmm. you know, they're in a monopoly position, so they can take a very large share. So, so China has to, if you like, find new growth drivers. Mm -hmm. And I think there's in these new productive forces, you know, because they also contribute in terms of education, medicine, you know, right across the many, many aspects of life. So I think that that's one of the reasons, you know, why there's strong emphasis upon these technologies. And, and also, you know, I mean, in the past, you know, the Western world has basically dominated and controlled intellectual property. And it's, it appropriates very, very high rents. You know, and the problem with that is it makes it unaffordable for many people. I mean, if you, you know, if, if you think about, I don't know, pharmaceuticals and what you have to pay, you know, for Pfizer pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and how that prevents their being used in parts of the world where mm -hmm. they could play a very important role. And then you have, I mean, even it's interesting, I mean, if you think about why was the BRICS initially established? Well, China was not involved. You know, it was three countries that were basically concerned about Genere being able to manufacture generic drugs to deal with the AIDS problem. And I wasn't aware of that. Well, that was, that, was, that, was, that was why. That was how it originally started, you mm. know. It was about, uh, you know, Af South Africa, Brazil, India, you know, and the question of Indian, Indian generic pharmaceuticals, you know, being used to deal with the AIDS problem in South Africa and Brazil. And they were impeded, you know, by the intellectual property mm. legislation that basically protected expensive, you know, U.S. produced pharmaceuticals. You know, so um, these these are other issues, you know, because I mean, if uh, if you have a more open attitude towards the spreading of knowledge and know-how, then that that is going to contribute to development. I mean, mm. that's a very, you know, this the new productive force. They include knowledge. You mm. know? Mm -hmm. Knowledge is a critical element and skill, you know, and that, that you know, so you see in the plenum this discussion about upgrading the skill profile and making sure that the skill profile matches, you know, the direction, you know, in which mm -hmm. the economy is moving in order to better meet human needs and improve the quality of human lives. Wow. Well, there's a lot to digest there. Um, yeah. You mentioned the goals of uh, 2035 and 2049. And if I could just ask you really briefly for us laymen, what are they? 
Well, I think China, China, China was first step. It wants to create a sort of advanced uh, socialist market economy, and then by 2049, the revitalization of Chinese civilization. I mean, Chinese civilization, you know, has more than 5,000 years of civilization. A remar you know, a remarkable succession of civilizations, often leading civilizations in the world, you know. But, I mean, mm. you know, from the middle of the 19th century, you know, China went into relative decline, you know. Um, so the, the, these are the goals. And by then, hopefully, China will, you know, have joined some of the richer countries in the world, but I mean, also we'll be playing a very active role in, the, in a multi, multipolar, multipolar world, you know, which, which respects civilization or difference, and you know, respects the choices that people make about their own development paths. Mm. This is part of the Global Civilization Initiative, and also China's uh, goal of non-interference of the internal uh, yes. economic development of other countries. You wrote a paper in 2023 in Area Development and Policy with Wei Dong Liu. Um, in which you discuss China as an, a, a ro its role in the emerging multipolar world. In the West, we do hear people disparage China and its role, especially with tra uh, words like debt trap, phrases like debt trap. How do you see China's relationship with other developing countries? Well, um, no, I mean, I think, I, you know, first of all, I think... Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, but also, you know, the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation yeah. Organization. These, these are very, very important new inter international organizations. Um, and then the BRICS also, you know, bringing together now 11, 11 countries, you know, which are... Um, so that's the first thing. I, th I think China, China, secondly, you know, these three, three initiatives, the Global Civilization Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, the uh, Indivisible Security Initiative, these are extremely important initiatives. You know, that, I mean, hopefully, you know, if, we, if one can move in the direction of indivisible security, so no country increases its security at the expense of another country, then you will actually create a kind of environment in which much more attention can be given to questions of, questions of development. Um, you know, I mean, China, China accumulated huge foreign reserves and it's used some of these reserves to contribute to international, you know, the International Monetary Fund, you know, mm -hmm. international organizations. But it's also been involved in helping set up the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment mm -hmm. Bank and in the establishment of the New Development Bank, you know, which are providing very important financial resources mm -hmm. for infrastructure development in the global south. And, you know, I said earlier, you know, China's own development was very importantly driven, you know, by the quality of the infrastructure that it provided and the way in which, if you like, it integrated the country and connected different parts of the country together. Mm. Um, China, China provides important uh, development assistance and it targets, it's interesting, it targets the poorest countries in the world. Mm. Now, you know, in that article, you know, we, we looked at some data on uh, the debt issue and it's very striking. No, if you look at the lowest low-income countries in the world, 50%, 52% of their gross national income, this was one year ago, uh, was basically uh, accounted for by debt. <coughs> um, but China only accounted for 5% mm. of their, their mm. gross national income. And China, but China accounted for 9% of their debt. So China lends to these countries, but it doesn't account for large share of their debt and of course it lends money you know for things like infrastructure provision you know but also for hospitals schools you know for social infrastructure mm -hmm. because social infrastructure you know in these countries is also extremely important mm. so you know i think i think it contributes contributes in that way um it was involved you know in swap arrangements you know in in, in the southeast asia and east asia you know mm. these swap arrangements you know play an important role in stabilizing economies when they're confronted with the instability, you know, of global financial markets, mm. you know, rapid outflows of money, you know, which, you know, I mean, which happened, of course, very strikingly in the, in the Asian financial crisis, you know, when then, you know, people could acquire uh, Hangwa, um, the assets, you know, mm -hmm. of um, South Korea, you know, and other countries at very, very low prices. They were shorted, basically. Mm. So, 
it's taken steps, you know, to try to stabilise these 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 um, international financial markets. So you know, I, th I think it, it's you know doing a lot of things on many fronts. I mean, obviously, you know, Chinese companies are internationalising, and mm -hmm. there it's important, you know, that they they conduct themselves well. But I mean, in that case, it's also striking. I remember that. Uh, the Chinese government demanded that several private companies withdraw from one African country but after they had refused to respect local environmental regulations. I mean, that, that is very important, you wow. know, very, very important. Um, I have another I, question. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Okay. I have another question related to the IMF and AIIB. Um, and I didn't, I didn't say anything that I was about this one, but I'm just really curious what your take on this is. China invested in IMF and World Bank. Yeah. They, they added a lot of money that can be used for loans to de the developing world. But then also China created its own you know, banking system along with other car pa partner countries around the world. I think they invested $100 billion initially into funds for the developing world. Why was it necessary to create an alternative investment agency and not just use the existing well, infrastructure? Uh, you know, as I recall... <coughs> Um, you know, China, China has tried to enter a large number of uh, international insti institutions. Um, one issue is that when, 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 when China provides money, can that sum be leveraged? Now, because of China's role in these institutions, these resources could not be leveraged. You know, in other words, you, you know, lend more than are deposited. So that meant the effectiveness and the use of these resources was limited. Mm. Now, China could not provide money in that form because basically its share in these institutions was restricted. Mm. It, want, it wanted to increase its share, but basically Western countries resisted attempts to allow China to increase its share. So to some extent, it was pushed in the direction of establishing alternative institutions where you know the funding can actually be leveraged and where China plays a more significant role in the mm. institutions. So I think that, that, is, that is quite important. Um, I mean, I think China getting involved is also very important because, you know, with the IMF, they impose Economic condition conditionalities. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, these conditions, well, I mean, you know, in a sense, one's going back to the problem of <coughs> the, or the, the, the problem of debt. Mm. You know, which, I mean, you know, it emerged in the 1970s and exploded initially in the 1980s. And since then, you know, most developing countries have basically been trapped in a web of debt where they need to take on new debt in order to repay past debt. So, I mean, it's a never ending cycle, you know, which, I mean, I mean, it's a cycle that China, of course, because it had a high degree of autonomy, avoided. Although, you know, China... You know, if you look at China's development, you know, it has had to repay debts. Yes, sure. <laughs> you know, in the you know, 1950s, you know, you had 156 projects with the Soviet Union mm. and Soviet loans, which were very, very important, you know, in China's very, very important. But then, the, when 1958, second, second five-year plan, they couldn't agree with the Soviet Union. You know, their relationship with the Soviet Union started to deteriorate after the death of Stalin. So uh, at that point, you know, the Soviets withdrew blueprints, they withdrew their technicians, and China had to repay loans, large loans. And that was one of the reasons for the Great Leap Forward, you know, because that, you know, the mm. if, if they didn't have loans, all you've got is central government resources, but the central government resources were too limited because they were using those to repay the loans. So you have to say, well, we have to decentralize, we have to rely on local initiative. And maybe local government didn't know what to do. But... So that was very striking. And then in the 1970s, you know, China, the, the minute after, after Nixon came, you know, China immediately took out international loans, you know, to import uh, Western technologies, Japanese technologies. And then again, you know, in the late 1950s, China, China took, uh, late 1970s, China had new loans. And then they had to repay those loans at that, so the time of reform and opening up, they were also confronted with the repayment of international loans. You know, but China has managed. You know, China has managed it effectively. You know, and again, it comes back to the competence of the CPC, of the mm -hmm. government, and so on. You know, in managing this situation, but also, you know, not getting into a situation which you couldn't, you know, get yourself out of. And in mm -hmm. many developing countries, it seems they've got themselves in situations that it's very difficult to find a way out of. I have one last question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I actually could I could go on for hours, but I have one <laughs> last question. Um, 
there is a lot of discussion about China's economy slowing down because the GDP uh, growth rate has been reduced. So a very general, yeah. wide open kind of question. What do you think are uh, China's economic prospects in the next few years? Personally, I think they're good. But except it confronts some serious global challenges to its growth. Um, you know, in the sense that it seems that some countries are treating, seeking to suppress China's growth. Hmm. So, I mean, the, I mean, the, the, I mean, these, these, these are important challenges. I mean, in that situation, you know, China has got to increase its self-reliance, and obviously, it will refocus on relations with BRICS, SCO, global South and East. It can, it can grow, you know, it can grow without doubt with the rest of the global South. You know, I mean, it, what will happen in terms of the relationships with the United States and Europe it, is difficult to say, but obviously they remain important markets for China, and China has important interests in these countries. So it needs to increase self-reliance, and uh, it needs to be less dependent, you know, on technologies, you know, that are controlled by uh, countries that are not well disposed towards China. Now, in that, you know, China grew at what, 5.3%, uh, 4.7%, so 5% in the first six months. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is an extremely creditable growth rate. Extremely creditable. In a world, in, in a world, I mean, if, in which many countries, if, in developed countries, are in recession. Mm -hmm. In Europe, many countries are in recession. And if they're growing at all, you know, it's very, very slow indeed. So, China, you know, China's performance is really quite remarkable, you know, in a, in a world in which, you know, the performance of the world economy is, leaves a very, very great deal to be desired. Mm. That's, the first, that's the first thing. Um, you know, some people say, you know, China should orient itself towards consumption. I said a while ago that investment, you know, investment creates infrastructure, it creates equipment that can then produce many goods. Yeah. You know, if you, if you consume something, something that you consume is destroyed almost. Many things are destroyed in the act of consumption. You know, they leave nothing behind. You know, so, mm. yeah, you know, if you want to increase productivity, then you increase investment. Mm. You know, you develop new technologies, you invest in new technologies. So China is choosing that path. You know, by moving in that direction, it may mean, you know, that the current rate of growth is a little slower than it ought to be. That, that, well, ought to be, then it might be, all right? So that's the second thing I would say. I'd say by developing these new, qualitatively new productive forces, by concentrating on investment, it's laying the foundations for the future, very, very important foundations for the future. In the short term, I mean, I think, you know, after this plenum, I mean, probably they're going to address some of these issues to do with employment and income and so on. So... Um, and I, you know, I suspect that there are ways of dealing with that. But I mean, I, you know, when it, if if you, I mean, I when I hear these the Western advisors, you know, I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, if their advice was so good, why are their own economies doing so poorly? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. that's a very I mean, interesting point. <laughs> that's an interesting point. You know, if you if they're, you know, I mean, you would have thought if if their advice is so good, their own economies would be performing in an outstanding way, but they're not. Mm. And yet China is. So in what sense do they think, you know, they are able to advise China about what it does? And, and I'd make another remark, okay, maybe a bit more controversial, but I said that there are people who want to suppress China's development. You know, I actually think that some of this advice is designed to suppress China's development. Mm. You know, advise China not to invest so much. You know, advise China not to, you know... Uh, move strongly in the direction of innovation. You know? um, That's fascinating. I think, I, I, I think that some of that advice is not um, necessarily well-meaning. Yeah. But I mean, this is, this is, it's, a, it's a kind of ideological, you know, there is a massive ideological campaign, you know, in the international media. And I mean, that it has, you know, I mean, it has to be challenged, you know, mm. and I think it can be challenged, you know, by showing how so many things in China work, how they worked in the past, how they're working now. Mm. Um, so, no, I, you know, I think, I think for China, the economic future looks good. You know, once we get through this, you know, turbulent, yeah, turbulent period.
That is all the time we have, sir. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the bridge one more time, <laughs> Professor Dunford. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. I mean, it's a great delight to speak to you, and um, I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Absolutely. Huh?